After the horrific murder of Trayvon Martin, the cop that pulled the trigger was brought to court. A friend of the late Martin, Rachel Chantel, was on the phone with them shortly before the murder, and she was brought in as a witness. Chantel spoke African-American vernacular English. According to Lisa Bloom, only one juror was not white, and the majority of the jury agreed Rachel Chantel was not credible. Juror B37 spoke about Chantel's testimony on CNN. I think she felt inadequate toward everyone because of her education and her communication skill, skills. Um, I just felt sadness for her. You felt like, what, she was in over her head? Well, not over her head. She just didn't want to be there. And she was embarrassed by being there because, because of her education and her communication skills that, that she just wasn't a good witness. It's very clear watching her speak in court, Chantel's voice was not understood and not respected. You said that it could have been, for all you know, Trayvon Martin smashing George Zimmerman in the face is what you actually heard. What? Yeah, just earlier today. By who? By you. And you ain't get that from me? John Rickford and Therese King, two linguists at Stanford, attribute her mistreatment to her vernacular. So you can't just disregard her because she happens not to be speaking the kind of dialect you would like to hear. If you're trying to have a judicial system that's fair, you have to give her a really fair trial, either providing translation or making extra special efforts uh, to make sure that everybody understands um, what she's saying. And there's some crucial points in the trial, like the one point at which she says, when she was asked by the prosecution, you know, could you hear um, what was being said when, when, uh, when Trayvon was, was, uh, was on the ground with Zimmerman. And she said, I couldn't. Uh, and it was Trayvon. I could you hear who it was that was, was screaming? He said, I couldn't. I couldn't. It was Trayvon. And the transcript of that deposition, which is not the same as a court transcript, said, I couldn't hear Trayvon. So it's a complete opposite. She's saying, yes, I could hear. And the transcript says, no, I couldn't hear. Um, and in fact, that turns out to be a major part of the trial because the defense attorneys were trying to show that she was lying, that she they were trying to imp impeach her testimony. Rickford and King also make it clear, not only is there a misunderstanding due to differences in dialect, but a prejudice, and that this linguistic prejudice runs deeper than this one case. And we have a set of um, uh, experiments that have been done in linguistics and social psychology that in fact show this very strikingly because they'll take the same speaker and they'll ask that speaker to read a passage in the guise of a French speaker or an English speaker or an African-American English speaker uh, and a standard English speaker. And then they'll ask listeners to rate them. And usually the listeners don't realize it's exactly the same person. And they'll find one speaker who speaks the, the, the standard or more prestigious um, uh, uh, accent, usually associated with a more prestigious group. Uh, as, you know, smarter, taller, more good-looking, uh, all kinds of ridiculous things. Um, so they, 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 I mean, what's very striking is that it is exactly the same person. So the voice quality is controlled for, but you're getting these readings off of the accents. And the readings off of the accents, in turn, go back to attitudes towards the speakers. Lippy Green has pointed out that news and entertainment media are a prime institutional source of negative stereotypes, especially Disney movies, which are particularly insidious because they appear to be harmless while systematically teaching children how to discriminate. The Mocking Crows in Dumbo and the Mean Hyenas in The Lion King, for instance, instill an association of dialect with trifling, bullying, and unsavory characteristics. Through the standard language ideology shaped by these and other forces, Trayvon Martin and Rachel Jantel were heard as non-standard, therefore less credible and more culpable than George Zimmerman, who, it should be noted, never took the stand. Linguistic discrimination stems primarily from the acceptance of a standard language ideology. The definition used here is a bias towards an abstracted, idealized, and homogenous spoken language which is imposed from above, and which takes as its model the written language. The most salient feature is the goal of suppression of variation of all kinds. Those deploying this ideology often presuppose without question the existence of a monoglot standard language. That is, there is an idealized nation-state that has one perfect, homogenous language. The ideology assumes that Ebonics is an inferior or less-than-legitimate variety of English, and that less-than-legitimate varieties of English ought to be controlled or eradicated so that speakers can succeed by educational, social, and economic assimilation. 
Which, I don't know, sounds a little fascist. The idea that the nation must be linguistically cohesive. Like Francisco Franco's brutal crackdown on any language in Spain that wasn't Castilian, or other 20th century actions even more horrific. I could go on a whole Chomsky-inspired rant, but I'll spare you that and move on. And I'm not saying this person here is a Nazi, just that, whether aware of it or not, Jur B-37's thought process is a bit... Ugh. Esteemed 19th century possible father of modern linguistics, Ferdinand de Saussure, uh, Ferdinand Saussure, once wrote, Finally, of what use is linguistics? Very few... Blah, 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 blah. But, and this is a paradoxical consequence of the interest that is fixed on linguistics, there is no other field in which so many absurd notions, prejudices, mirages, and fictions have sprung up. From the psychological viewpoints, these errors are of interest, but the task of the linguist is, above all else, to condemn them and dispel them as best he can. To put it simpler, John Rickford wrote during the Ebonics controversy in the 90s, In sum, sociolinguists should be involved in the great language debates of our times. So, linguistic discrimination finds itself nestled deep within our American culture, from the character of a poo in The Simpsons to condescending assholes to downright neo-Nazis. And it is the responsibility of linguists to correct these prejudices, and for everyone else, it is our responsibility to recognize these prejudices and attempt to correct them, in part so when it truly matters, someone like Rachel Jantel can be respected and understood.